going to resume that now. All right, Dr. Myers, I am going to bring up your presentation here and okay. let's get started. Okay. Uh, as Liz mentioned to you, I have a fairly long background in education. And uh, one of the things that has always interested me are the different kinds of schoolings, uh, choices that go on. Uh, I'm originally from Pittsburgh in a suburb called Edgewood, which was a small suburb right on the city limits of Pittsburgh, surrounded by, uh, if you know anything about large cities, they have neighborhoods that are ethnically very similar. Uh, the neighborhood I went to was probably upper middle class and all Caucasian. We were surrounded by uh, various communities. Uh, one was primarily Italian, another was primarily Jewish, uh, another one was African American. Uh, up until probably the third or fourth year of my teaching career, uh, I only thought that there were public schools and private schools. And uh, as I was a, a kid growing up, I knew that there were public schools because I went to one. I knew that there were Catholic schools or private Catholic schools uh, because anybody who was Catholic in my community went to those. I also knew there were Jewish schools for two reasons. Number one, uh, I had friends that lived in Squirrel Hill, which is the Jewish community, and they went to a different kind of school that wasn't public. Uh, and the other thing was that the first time we drove through Squirrel Hill on Sunday, I noticed they had school uh, because Sunday is not Sabbath uh, for those who are Jewish. So uh, that just surprised me that they were having school. The only other kind of school I knew about was Kiski Prep because the community I grew up had a very rich family that you probably have heard of, which is uh, the Rockwell family, as in the uh, Rockwell space industry. They're the ones that built all the space shuttles and things like that. And uh, I went to school with Willard up until ninth grade where he left and went to Kiski Prep. The only other famous person from my hometown was Ellen Isley. Uh, the Isley family makes Klondikes. So uh, her house was very popular on, uh, when we went around at Halloween when we did that. So I really didn't know much about schools. And for most of my early career, I thought everybody ought to go to a public school. What's all this you know, going to other schools? I have since changed that. So uh, what we're going to do today is talk about the various choices that schools can have. I'm going to go through and give some definitions first, and then given the time, we'll go back and do positives and negatives. When we do that, I'll have you unmute so that you can add any comments that you want to make. And in fact, anytime you have a question, to be honest, it's okay if you unmute because there aren't that many of you and it won't be a problem. Uh, I am teaching a class at the university this semester on diversity, and I'm teaching it on Zoom, and uh, which is a whole new thing I've never taught, not being face-to-face. -face. So uh, I'm getting used to Zoom. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Uh, okay, and go to the next one after that. Okay. These are the types of choices that people now have uh, to educate their children. Uh, and some of these you may have not heard of. Uh, and I'm guessing some of them you may have some definite opinions on. First choice, public schools, then private schools, charter schools, which is a very somewhat controversial topic these days, homeschooling, online schooling and unschooling. And the unschooling is one that uh, folks don't know that much about uh, from what I've found. So let's talk a little bit about public schools. 
Okay, a public school is a school that runs on public funds, usually government imposed taxes. It's free for everyone to go to a, a primary or secondary public school. Uh, this isn't def my definition and we all know they aren't truly free because in August, if you've ever had to pay for your children or grandchildren's fees, you know that there's a lot of them. Uh, so next slide. Okay, public schools uh, exist in all 50 states, in all territories of the United States, and also on uh, military bases throughout the world. They have a series of schools there that are also public schools, uh, particularly in foreign countries. In the U.S. and military bases, the students tend to go to the public school by the military base. They are supported by taxpayer money. Uh, you, whether you send children or have children, you are paying either property tax or income tax, and you have the opportunity to vote on them uh, and whether to approve them or not to approve them. The uh, general statement by folks in education is uh, they do receive taxpayer money, but uh, never enough. And uh, so they, you know, one of the things about public schooling is the funding for them. Generally, they go kindergarten to 12th grade, although public schools have gotten into preschool education also. Bowling Green has uh, students in preschool at Crim and at Conneaut and probably Kenwood, the three elementary schools at this point in time. Uh, they are open to all students that live within a school district, generally ages 5 to 21. The 21 is a surprise to people, uh, but typically kids aren't going to want to hang around for three years after they graduate. Uh, that's mainly there for uh, students who may have special needs or uh, disabilities. Uh, Wood Lane, for example, will frequently serve their students until they're 21 and they can switch over to adult services. Uh, as a principal, I only had one person over the age of 18 ever want to stay at the high school. And actually it was someone moved in and I believe that he wanted to sell some pharmaceutical products uh, to the students. He wasn't really there for an education and he lasted two days when he realized that I was not going to put up with it. Uh, and so he and his uh, drug selling signs went elsewhere uh, to do that. The other thing about public schools is transportation is provided. Uh, it's not real well known, although school districts are learning this now. Uh, you don't have to provide transportation for high school students. And I believe Perrysburg is not providing transportation and I don't know if it's Lake has uh, for some time not provided, necessarily provided transportation for students, but they do have to provide transportation. Uh, and I'll mention transportation again when we get uh, in a minute here when we talk about private schools. Uh, so these are public schools and Given some time, we'll come back and talk about the positives and negatives. Well, let's move on to private schools. Okay, a private school is founded, conducted, and maintained by a private group rather than the government, usually charging tuition and often following a particular philosophy or viewpoint, etc. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Private schools uh, do not have the same rules, regulations to follow that public schools do. Uh, they can most certainly teach subjects that public schools cannot uh, in their classes. They are not public and they are not responsible to public taxpayers. They can uh, do what they want 
they finance themselves. Again, mostly have tuition, uh, and it can go from anywhere from three, four thousand dollars a year up to, and I'll tell you, give you an example a little bit later of some schools that cost up, upward of forty or fifty thousand dollars a year to attend a private school. They are in general smaller in student population unless you go to a big city uh, where you would have, for example, Central Catholic is very large in Toledo, in the Cleveland area, Lakewood St. Edwards, St. Ignatius. Uh, those schools are very, very large, bigger than, say, Bowling Green and a lot of schools like that. There is a variety kind of public schools. The first we're all familiar with is the faith-based parochial schools. And when you say private or parochial school, which is what faith-based means, the first thing that comes to your mind are the, is the Catholic schools that exist. Um, in Bowling Green School District, we have two Catholic schools, St. Louis and Custer, which is a very small school. And then we have uh, St. Aloysius here in Bowling Green, uh, which is a very popular school. Uh, Faith-based based is not just Catholic. They are by far the largest uh, of the faith-based schools with nationwide uh, schools. They are run by the diocese. So the Toledo Diocese oversees most of the parochial schools uh, within their diocese, which goes, I'm not quite sure how far south, but probably Lima or maybe a little north of that and goes east until it would run into probably Sandusky area, but everything else in there would be in the Toledo diocese. And they are obviously broken down. I am not Catholic, um, so I'm not an expert on this, but they are broken down by uh, for example, the uh, St. Francis, Franciscan schools or Jesuit, you know, so they have subdivisions. Other religious schools in our area, uh, the Baptist, there was Emmanuel Baptist School, which I think has merged. Uh, there are uh, several Jewish schools in the Sylvania area, uh, just off of Sylvania Avenue. There are uh, two Islamic schools in Toledo that exist. And then there are schools that are uh, Bowling Green, such as Bowling Green Christian Academy uh, in Bowling Green. And there are other Christian schools. Toledo Christian is the largest and most active uh, of schools that fall under that base. They are not all of one governance. Uh, they are more or less independent on their own. Another type of private school is Montessori. Uh, Bowling Green has a Montessori school. Most towns uh, of fair size have a Montessori school. This is based on the teaching philosophies of, I believe it's Maria Montessori, who is from Europe. And it's more, it's a system more based on freedom of decision by the children. Uh, it is less structured curriculum than a public school. It's uh, an example might be the teacher would say it's time for science and then the students would go over to a bookcase where there would be a variety of science lessons and they could pick one of those and learn from that. So it gives the students some choices uh, and very much less of the structured discipline than you would find in a public school. There are prep schools I mentioned, uh, Kiskey Prep in Pittsburgh. Prep schools have the reputation of wealthy people attending them. Um, there is not, there are not any prep schools in the Toledo area, but Detroit has several, Cleveland has several, for example, the university school in Cleveland is a prep school, uh, and these are very pricey places to attend. There are private military academies or schools. Uh, the closest one to us is in Indiana, and it's Howe Military Academy. 
and uh, people will go there for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is they are boarding schools, so uh, they don't commute. You would go there and attend there, uh, and you would stay there. You get a variety of different students there. They say this with all respect. Sometimes you get some troubled students who need the strict discipline of a military school, or you get the child of someone who is in the military in a career military, and uh, this is a way that they can have some normalcy by going and staying at a military school. Another type of private school are the country day schools. Uh, obviously in Toledo, we have the Mommy Valley Country Day School. And this again is a British style of learning system. They don't, for example, they don't have principals, they have headmasters, uh, and they have a little more freedom. Uh, in Toledo, a very large percent of the population who attend uh, Mommy Country, uh, Mommy Valley Country Day School are international students, um, might be children of physicians. Um, we have, we do have folks coming from Bowling Green who go to Maumee Valley Country Day School. They uh, have a bus that comes to Bowling Green and takes the students there. My son lives in Evansville, Indiana. He lives about two miles from the Evansville Country Day School. And for kicks, he checked out the tuition and it's $40,000 a year. Uh, I have no idea what Maumee Valley's is, whether it's more or less, but they can be expensive. So these are the kinds of private schools that exist. Again, they do not get public money, although very quickly, I'll give you a real quick school law. They do receive textbooks paid by the public, um, and they also receive transportation. So Bowling Green City Schools transports to St. Al's to Montessori to the Bowling Green Christian Academy, the St. Louis uh, schools. They also transport to Toledo St. John's and to Layao, which is a um, innovative type school that is uh, Catholic based, which is near uh, Waterville and White House. The general rule is if it's within 30 minutes of your school district, the public school has to transport. So we do provide that transportation for them. The other choice is you can pay them to transport their own child so they can ask for that. Next type of school is a charter school. And uh, Lynn, since I can see you, is a charter school public or private? I'll give you a quick answer. You don't have to answer that. The quick answer is yes. Okay, <laughs> you couldn't have been wrong. <laughs> the uh, charter schools are also known as community schools and charter schools are public operated, but they're very, very much different from a uh, public school. Charter or community schools are independently operated public schools that have the freedom to design classrooms that meet their standard needs. Uh, you can read this and I don't really want to read to you, but it's common to see charter schools are led by former teachers who want to take the lessons they learn and apply those. There are a lot of chartered schools. There are hundreds in Ohio. Uh, basically what they are, are if uh, Liz and I wanted to start a charter school, we could. We would just fill out an application with the state to meet certain requirements of which educationally we both have. And we could pick a topic that we wanted our charter school to be. And then uh, doing some other paperwork get sanctioned by a governing body. You may or may not have heard of the Toledo School for the Arts. Uh, it is a charter school. It is probably one of the top certainly 100 charter schools in the nation, probably higher than that. Uh, it's a, uh, obviously with the School for the Arts, it has very much, uh, its students are into dance, music, drama, uh, art, computers, 
design, uh, things like that. So uh, I'll use them as an example because a long time ago I sort of uh, provided some advice to them uh, when they were getting started. Uh, they have 400 students in their charter school. They get their money from the public schools that their students uh, would have attended if they didn't go to the charter school. So at Bowling Green, uh, we have, I don't know the official number, somewhere around eight students who go to Toledo School for the Arts. So the money we receive for the state or that student goes to Toledo School for the Arts. So they may get, and this is a guesstimate, about $10,000 for each student who goes there. Uh, and Bowling Green does not get that money. There's a movement um, to also get the local money raised for that student to go to the charter school, but I don't believe that's happened yet. They have a different set of rules. They can set up topics. Other charter schools in Toledo include the Maritime uh, Charter School. Uh, there is a company that runs charter schools called Horizon. And if you look in Toledo at charter schools, there are multiple charter schools with Horizon in their title. If you find a bunch of charter schools that have something like Horizon in the name, they are run by a for-profit organization. Uh, and in the case of Horizon, I believe they're out of Detroit. Uh, and at one point there was a large controversy because uh, one year they turned in about a $20 million profit, which did not sit well, uh, you know, with public schools uh, when they did that. Charter schools used to not have to take the state tests. They take them now. Private schools also take the state test. They just don't have to release their results of them. Charter schools um, now have to release the results they didn't originally. Uh, we'll, we'll come back and talk about the pros and cons of charter schools, but back to the example um, of charter schools very quickly. You can just stay where you are, you're fine. Um, okay. 400 kids go to the charter school, uh, Toledo School for the Arts, and they are 100 a year, and they do a lottery at the start of the freshman year. All the kids that want to go, and believe me, they get hundreds and hundreds who want to go to the Toledo School for the Arts. It's uh, downtown. It's off of Monroe. It's near the Toledo Club, if that means anything to anybody. Uh, it's in an old high school um, the name of it. it starts with an M and it was a vocational school. Uh, they're in that that area, that building. Uh, so 100 kids get picked in a lottery to come in. If you're interested in the lotteries and the effects that they have on school, you can look for a video called Waiting for Superman. And it's the story of five or six families in New York and their attempts to get their kids into charter schools. And uh, it's very interesting. So that's waiting for Superman. So next kind of schooling is homeschooling. And uh, last spring, just about everybody was doing homeschooling. They weren't calling it that. Uh, but homeschooling is when a parent decides to educate their child at home for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's usually conducted by a parent or a paid tutor, or they hire an online teacher. And again, there are, there's a company called Bennett, I believe, and um, they provide home, home schooling uh, curriculum and advice uh, for that. Uh, United Kingdom calls it uh, home education. Homeschooling uh, has been around for a while. It's a legal option for parents. It has grown uh, as people are dissatisfied or worried about safety of public schools. Uh, other reasons that people homeschool is that uh, one is that the parents are very religious and they want their child to be raised by their religion or their faith. 
and uh, they don't necessarily agree with the education that they get in a public school, mainly in areas like biology uh, and, th and those kind of areas. They, uh, so they will raise their child. Another typical homeschooling, we get a lot of this in, in Wood County, is the parents are professors. The mother or father may not work, but they have advanced degrees and they will educate their children uh, for what they can do. Uh, when we get to positives and negatives, I'll mention a couple negatives about homeschooling that are not in general, I mean, they're not typical. Uh, and I'm not opposed to homeschooling. I have my niece's uh, in-laws live in Oregon and they live on a farm that they bought. They are not farmers, but they have goats and chickens and things and they are uh, homeschooling their children. And I have to tell you, their daughter is brilliant and they have done everything they can to make her successful. Uh, and she's going to end up going to medical school. So uh, neither one of them are in that area. He happens to be a pilot for Alaska Airlines, but uh, obviously they've done a good job. So that's homeschooling. Uh, if you meet the basic requirements, anybody can homeschool. And the requirements are pretty basic. Uh, that what you have to do. And again, there are a variety of reasons to do that. Okay. The next uh, choice is online schooling. And online schooling is exactly what it says. Uh, you go to school virtually. You do everything online. Uh, you the Students can manage studies from afar within a structured curriculum. Uh, obviously, the university is making very much use of this this fall, for example, the course I'm teaching that's on Zoom. Uh, and this is mainly how public schools did March through June last spring is online. Uh, online schooling ha is used a couple different ways. One way is it's uh, my granddaughter took courses online her senior year she actually came out of Ferris State, so she got college credit, uh, never leaving her home for doing online courses. So there are ways that, you know, you need to take a course, but you can't fit it in your schedule. You can do it online from somewhere because somebody's going to offer it. Uh, University-wise, Phoenix University, out of Phoenix, Arizona, has over 100,000 students. They're all online. They don't have a campus, per se. Uh, so colleges, there's a little more online schooling than there are in public schools. The other main common thing that is used uh, by public schools is uh, to make up credits that you are deficient in. Uh, I taught for a while students who, frankly, weren't very good students, and they were in my class because they were pretty much in trouble all the time. And I, uh, we used credit makeup. We used online courses so that they can uh, make up the credit so they can graduate on time. It's got the same issues anything else does. You've got to be motivated to do it. Uh, you can't just flop a student down in front of a computer and tell them to do it because uh, it takes some motivation and they don't necessarily always have it. So that's online schooling. Hello, Holly. And um, the last type of schooling that I'm going to talk about, and actually Holly was in a discussion with me on this one last week, is unschooling. And unschooling is not really well known. Uh, it also was known as no schooling. So that ought to give you a little bit of an idea of what happens. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, it, uh, unschooling is an informal learning that advocates the learner children uh, provide their own means for learning. Unschooling learn through their natural life experiences, their play, their household responsibilities, personal interests, and curiosity. 
and as they get older, internships and work experience, travel. Uh, it encourages kids to explore things. So the parents, there is no formal parents or there are no formal guidelines for this. They just let their children be. Um, it kind of goes along with the theory that do you let a child touch something hot so they learn that hot is dangerous? Well, in this case, it's you're letting children, maybe they're outside and they see a grasshopper and they want to look more into what grasshoppers are or why they are. There's no set curriculum. Uh, they don't believe in a set curriculum. It uh, doesn't have grading systems. It's pretty much the child is being free. Uh, be honest, I don't know anybody who does this. Uh, but there, you can see videos on YouTube uh, that promote unschooling if you're interested more in that. So those are the types of schooling that uh, young parents have a choice of what they want to do with their children. Uh, if we want to stop just for a second before I go back to positives and negatives, uh, if you want to unmute, if you have any questions you want to ask me, now's a good time to go ahead and ask. I did just ask you all to unmute. You'll have to accept that if you'd like to ask a question. <clears throat> I think looks like you're all unmuted. Does anyone have any questions? I have a question about homeschooling. Okay. Um, I know because I have nieces and nephews that are homeschool, and now do when they graduate, is it the state that says they have all their credits and all their requirements, and that they can graduate with a bunch of other homeschools? Is that how they do that? Generally, they take the GED or the oh, okay. gradu graduate equivalent degree. That, okay. Uh, so they can earn that. Children who are homeschooled can also take classes from public schools and they can also participate on sports teams without even being enrolled in a public school. Uh, so they do have access to public schools. The most common time for students who go, uh, who are homeschooled to come back to public schools is at the start of high school. Yeah. And they can also, if they want to know where they are and things, public schools tend to want to know whether these students know things or not. They can be given the final exams for the course they want credit for. Okay. To see how they do. Uh, but no, the state does not issue a diploma to them. Okay. But they, they are checked up on though by the state to yes, make they sure to that they're equivalent to what they're supposed to be doing right they are given they have to reapply every year okay they have to present a, a uh, curricula that they're going to follow it doesn't have to be in depth and they don't have to provide details but they have to say okay we will be doing social studies and they might put in this year u.s government okay or um you know they also have to have a first aid course and they tend to need a phys ed course also, I believe. But they also have to make sure that they have the, the social studies, the language arts, the math, and the science. Okay. Well, these kids had the option to go to high school, but none of them wanted to do it. And some of them have gone on to college and gotten their bachelor degrees but they all have great jobs today, the ones that have graduated. So, I mean, they're not dumb kids. Oh, they no. just, yeah, they just have to be, stay at home. I had a student who was a junior at the university who happened to be in music, music ed. Uh, he was homeschooled his entire height, his entire K-12. He had a four point. Yeah. And he most certainly got an A in my class. Um, so no, there's no uh, stigma with being homeschooling. They certainly are very intelligent individuals. Yeah. Um, and obviously it's something that fits people. 
So I used to have thoughts on non-public education. Now I think it's whatever fits the family. The family ought to have the choice as long as they're making informed decisions. Yeah. Okay. Any other right, questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, I always thought kind of the, like Mommy Valley Country Day School was just called that. It was just part of the name, but apparently it must, it must, there must be, so, it's called Country Day School. I, I always thought yeah. maybe it was out in the country at one point and then they moved to the city. I don't know. I believe it originally came from England. Okay. And uh, then came over to the United States. But they're, they're international. They're, uh, and uh, the official name of the first part is the Country Day School. And I would presume there's some kind of international association, although I don't know that. Okay. Good question. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, let's go back to public school and we'll talk about some pros and cons. Uh, we have about 15 minutes, so, you know, if you want to stay unmuted, uh, you can ask questions anytime you want. And please interrupt me, feel free. I like it in my college classes when students ask questions because it means they're listening. And uh, it's just not always a given. Okay, the, the positives for public schools is that they're free to all, with the caveat I told you about. Uh, they're open to all. So anybody who lives within a school district or anyone who wants to open and enroll in a school district can open and enroll. Uh, they frequently have a whole lot of options of classes you can take. They certainly have all kinds of options and extracurricular activities and in the arts. The teachers are required to have licenses and the administrators are required to have licenses. Uh, because if they don't, they won't get paid. And not too many people are going to volunteer to do that in the public school. They have detailed discipline plans. And they are overseen by school boards and, and the state oversee them. Um, negatives, you'll see a common thread here. They're open to all. So you have to take students. Uh, my, my life as a principal might have been easier if I was able to pick and choose uh, who intended the, the uh, high school, but I didn't have that option. And quite honestly, I didn't want it. But the negatives is the state oversees and passes rulings uh, that you have to deal with. They are frequently, another word for them is called unfunded mandates. These are things that the state tells you must, you must do, but they don't give you any money to do them. And uh, so it just costs the school district more and more. Uh, another negative is all the testing that the state has and it, for a while, it's been cut back, but it used to be about 15% of your time of the school year was on testing, okay? Which obviously takes you out of the classroom, which means you aren't gonna learn as much, so you aren't gonna do as well on the test. Funding's often lack lacking, and there is very much inequity in funding. Uh, you can take a look at the extremely wealthy schools, and then you can take a look at most urban high school or urban schools where they do wonderful work, but not with a whole lot of money because the folks who live there don't have a whole lot of money to support them. So there's often inequities. In fact, in Ohio, our funding system was ruled illegal in the 90s, the Durolf case. Uh, and the state was told to fix the inequity in funding. And so that was 27 years ago. We're still looking at it. So, okay, let's go to private. Okay, positives about private schools is it allows parents to choose the educational approach for their children. Uh, if they want a faith-based school, they most certainly can do that. It allows for students having similar backgrounds 
and it can individualize instruction because they're typically smaller. So that the uh, student teacher ratio is uh, more conducive to individual learning. Negatives are that they may have fewer courses because they're not that big, but in this day and age, you can get extra courses online. So for example, if you had a student who wanted to learn Russian, they're not going to bring in a teacher to teach Russian, but they are going to hook that student up with an online course, a distance learning course for them. Public schools may lack diversity, and I'll talk about that in a second. It can create elitism in students. Uh, I say this with all respect, but some school districts, some private schools really promote the quality of their school and the quality of their students and that they are more so than a public school. Uh, so it can create an illusion of elitism in their students. It can be expensive, as I mentioned, up to 40, 45,000. And I don't even want to think about how much it would cost in New York or California or uh, Massachusetts for that area. Uh, private schools have fewer state requirements. Um, they, uh, one item that's not on here, and I don't know if it's a positive or a negative, but they are allowed to have religious classes and all students, if they're a religious school, and all students will attend. The irony of this is, a few years ago, the statistic came out that 60% of the students at St. John's Jesuit are not Catholic. Okay. So a lot of parochial schools have students who are not necessarily that faith. And the reason that I mentioned this is the last reason is that often private schools in the South, and Louisiana is a prime example, use private schools to avoid integration. They uh, will send their students to private schools as to not attend schools that have minority groups, uh, which in those schools are probably the majority of the students at that time. Um, so, you know, in some areas, it's a way to get around the federal law on integration. Uh, and in that case, they would lack diversity with that. So those are private schools. Not all of these are true of all private schools. Uh, and the quality of education in private schools can be very, very good. Uh, so I have, okay. go ahead. Um, is uh, in, in private schools, um, in order to be a private school, um, does the state board of education or whoever say you have to teach so much, whatever? They, they still have requirements such as social studies. Yeah, they still have curriculum they have to have. Okay. They're gonna, they're gonna wanna have. Yeah. But the difference, main difference is they also have religion classes. Yeah, right. And I mentioned to you textbooks Public schools have to provide textbooks uh, for uh, private schools. Mainly it goes to the religious-based schools. Uh, in, in all honesty, it's not local money, it's state money. It just flows through. But the textbooks cannot be used for religious classes because of the line between uh, government and religion. Uh, so. I asked my students who went to parochial schools, did their textbooks have all kinds of things stamped in their science or social studies books saying this book is property of, I'll use Bowling Green as an example. Uh, Call from 866 You can answer my telemarketer call, call if from you want. 866 Well, okay. the a lot of the parochial schools only go to eighth grade. That's correct. But if you've got a high school like St. John's does and some of the other Catholic schools in Toledo, they have to teach certain classes because without so many years of English and these other courses, you're not able to graduate, right? That is correct. They still have to meet the state 
graduation requirements. Right. The school has to be accredited. Um, a private school near here that Bowling Green served wasn't accredited and then they wanted to have their kids transported by BG buses. So they had to go through state accreditation. Okay, because we don't, if they're not accredited, we don't have to provide them with books or transportation. So they went ahead and did that, which was a right. good thing for their school. Um, other than that, uh, let's go ahead and take a quick look at charter and Okay, like I said, charter schools are publicly funded, but they're run like private schools. Uh, the state does not come in and tell them what kind of discipline code they have to have, uh, how they do their coursework. Um, the positive is they're able to mold schools to meet the needs of students and community. There are a lot of elementary age charter schools. Uh, because the parents want to keep their kid in the neighborhood. There are some in Toledo that w require uniforms, you know, that a public schools, some do and some don't. Uh, there are schools that are uh, STEM charter schools that are science and math or a specialty area. Uh, if you remember the TV show Fame, F-A-M-E, uh, that was actually a charter school for the arts. Uh, and that type of thing. Uh, they're often community-based. Near where my wife is from, a small town merged with the big city of Terre Haute, and it's like 40 minutes to Terre Haute, and it was merged in their district. And they didn't want to send their little kindergartners into Terre Haute for education, so they bought the elementary school that was going to be closed, and they created a charter school and all the residents of that community went to the charter school. <laughs> so they used their head. Okay, they, somebody had a great, great idea for them. Charter schools often have more parent involvement and it's open to all within limits. You have to meet, get in through the lottery. Negatives, people are complaining that uh, funding goes, takes money from public schools. There's a lack of state control. Uh, there's frequent untimely failure. The uh, charter schools have a large record of being there on Friday and closing on Monday, even during the year. Uh, and if you go on the Ohio Department of Education website, you will also be able to see a list of charter schools that have closed. And what happens is that there's no follow-up on those students uh, and they go, uh, they could go to, uh, they're supposed to go to a public school and say, you know, my charter school closed, I'm back to school, but public schools don't know who they are. Uh, so that doesn't happen to them. So they do uh, ultimately, uh, you wanna check your charter school out carefully. They also frequently have untrained teachers and administrators. I taught classes and training principals. And I was filled with people who were acting administrators in charter schools trying to get their principal's license to do that. Now that's a little less frequent as time goes on. The other thing they can do is remove a student without due process <laughs> and just say, you know, we're sick and tired of your behavior, you're out of here. And what a gift that would be to all educators. Uh, but uh, in, in this case, they can actually do that. So uh, those are positives and negatives of charter schools. They're kind of not understood uh, by the general public, uh, particularly if you're not in a city where there are a lot of charter schools. So, uh, homeschooling. Positives are the ability to choose the curriculum. Uh, you can protect a child from the influence of others. Uh, we had a fair amount of, we had an incident many years ago to, outside of our junior high when it was still junior high downtown where a kid had a knife 
And we had multiple parents immediately homeschool their children because of that issue. Uh -huh. And they were seeing that it was safe. They had choose your curriculum. That's frequently a faith-based uh, choice for people. It's safety, as I mentioned. You can do different educational experiences. Uh, <laughs> you can go on field trips or you can go on field trips, depending on how you want to spell that word, I guess. Uh, but you can, you know, I've run into families who take vacations and use it as educational experience, which it is. Uh, you know, or they might go to the art museum on any given day or the zoo. Uh, they can set up the curriculum however they want and they can use whatever experiences they want to do it. Uh, you can focus on the predominant interest of the child. Very frequently, really, really good ice skaters like the Sisney girls who were from Bowling Green uh, would homeschool because they had to go to Detroit to do their skating during the day and training. So a, a regular schedule wouldn't work. Scott Hamilton from a long time ago uh, went to Bowling Green High School for his first two years and then he moved to Colorado Springs in the Olympic Training Center and he was sort of homeschooled there uh, while he was there, but yet he came back. We gave him a high school diploma because we're not stupid. Uh, we needed, we wanted to have Scott Hamilton graduate from our high school, so we could claim him, and we have. Um, <laughs> and homeschooling is potentially less expensive because uh, you know you, you you can pick your curriculum where you want. You can get it offline. Um, some negatives are the lack of social experience with other children, although many homeschoolers now belong to uh, groups. Uh, the church I happen to attend on, uh, I think it's Friday's hosts, a homeschool. Yeah, well, family. yeah. Yeah. I don't believe in that one because the kids play basketball and they're in all kinds of sports, even though they're homeschooled and they have all kinds of friends. So I don't think they're really missing out on anything. No, this is, uh, these aren't necessarily my negatives. Uh, I don't, I, I don't believe that because they, other kids get home at 2.30 in the afternoon and these kids are going to be out socializing with them. Yeah, that's right. So and I'm not sure that, you know, that really happens. Uh, homeschooling might give you a narrow view of the world. Depends on your experience. Uh, you might have parents lack experience expertise in teaching. Uh, to be honest with you, when I was assistant superintendent, I was in charge of expulsion hearings and frequently students who were going to be expelled uh, immediately asked to be homeschooled before I could rule that they were expelled. Okay, and then I had to help the parents fill out the form because I was in charge yeah. of homeschooling too. Uh, so kids, you know, it could be used as a way to avoid punishment. That doesn't happen too much. The other thing is you all know teenagers. And uh, the average teenager can get too much family time. At least they think they can. So, uh, you know, that also could be a negative. Uh, okay, we can... How long do you want me to go, Liz? I have a question to ask you about school, the problems today. Okay. Do you think that the kids and the teachers should be in school to teach right now? <laughs> or, or, I mean, what's your feeling on that? <laughs> okay, this has nothing to do with, I mean, this is just my personal opinion, okay? Right. Well, yeah. I think it's too soon. Uh, I had the chance of teaching a class at the university face to face and I declined it um, because of health conditions myself and my wife. I just didn't want to take the chance. Uh, I think the schools are going to do everything in their power to make it safe. I do too. Uh, but, you know, and, until there's some proof that they can actually do that, uh, I'm not sure that it's safe. But I, you know, Again, there are a whole lot of parents who need their children in school because they can't yeah. get them here. 
it will be interesting to see what happens in the next month or two, and especially when the flu season comes around again. Uh, well, I also think that a lot has to do with the students themselves to act properly and, you know, uh, do what they're supposed to do. And I'm just hoping that everything works out okay. I'm like you. Yeah, I, I hope just it hope does. everything works out okay and we don't, you know, that they, everybody gets back into the classroom. Yeah. I'm teaching a course on Zoom and I really, really, really like my students. But do I trust them on weekends? I don't yeah. know. I mean, I don't know them well enough. But a lot of them, yes. You have to remember at BGSU, 95% of the students are good kids and do what they're supposed to do. And most of them have jobs. It's the 5% you know, that are going to have the parties and things like that. Yeah. Uh, well, I worked there for 37 years. Okay. And even back in the 60s, we had kids that knew what they were supposed to be doing when they came to school. And then we had others that was just there to get away from mom and dad. And the biggest agenda was how many parties we could have on, especially on weekends. So yeah, in I 30, 40 years, nothing's changed. I'm fortunate to work with teacher education and they have to behave because if they get anything on their record, they won't get a teacher's license. Yeah. Let me run through online schooling very quickly. Uh, it's good. It adjusts the personal schedule. It can be helpful. You can't actually attend. This is very good for students with disabilities or illnesses. Uh, it's a way to make up credits, but it relies on student responsibility. You may have a lack of personal interaction and you lack some connectivity. The other thing that can happen to you is that there was a statewide online school called ECOT. And uh, they would provide you allegedly with a computer and stuff. And they built the state out of millions and millions and millions of dollars. And it just closed because uh, they were getting in trouble from the state. And all of a sudden, you had 10,000 students that had to go somewhere. So that's an example of online schooling. Unschooling, you could figure out. The positives and negatives. I, you know, I don't yeah. think I really trusted my children to decide what they want to educate themselves in. <laughs> so, so that's my summary of school choices. Uh, can I answer any questions? Yes, I want to know how long the, the teachers' union's been. And uh, I don't think we had it when we were kids. Uh, not probably. Not everybody had them. I started teaching in 1969, and they most certainly had them then. Uh, okay. The, and the other thing is I want to know, um, do all of the schools have to, uh, the teachers like in the schools and that, do they all have to be in the union or not? No. They, um, you can, first of all, the majority of teachers have to vote to have a union. So if they, and they don't have a choice of, uh, different unions in a school. Okay, it's either NEA or American Federation of Teachers. You vote for one of those, you have that. Uh, Ohio has a rule that if your school has a union and you don't want to join, you don't have to, but you still have to pay 85% of the expense of joining the union because you get the benefits that the union does for you. Okay. Um, so that, that's what it's like in Ohio. And frankly, when you're paying 85%, you might as well pay 100%. Well, my that's grandson what? just got his teaching degree, and he can't find a job because they're letting people go everywhere. But he did get an offer at some charter school in okay. Maumee. Yeah. But um, I didn't know what he needed to do. He probably knows already, but yeah. I was just wondering. As far as unions, they don't have – charter schools don't have unions. Yeah, yeah, because that's all he's been able to find so far. Yeah. Also, well, I wanted to know. It's a, good place um, to, it's a good place to start. Yeah, I was wondering too about um, what you think of all of the the stuff the government has put in, like uh, the the Common Core and all that stuff. I know Perrysburg didn't implement all of it because they didn't agree with all of it, and the the residents objected to it, so they kind of slimmed it down a little bit. But I know Bowling Green, uh, my grandson's going to graduate high school this year, can't read or write cursive. They don't teach it. 
and my they, grandson yeah, that's a college, teacher yeah, yeah, what he did. my college kids can't write cursive now in Perrysburg they teach them in the second grade all my yeah. grandkids from Perrysburg can read and write cursive but not the bowling green ones and guess, even my older I, grandkids that are like in their mid-20s don't know how yeah they uh i mean frankly the only thing you really need to do is be able to sign your name in cursive the rest you can yeah, well um my grandkids get letters from their grandparents and they're always in cursive they their mom has to read them to them because they can't <laughs> yeah. read them yeah which i think is just horrible <laughs> my handwriting is so bad i'm not sure cursive is a blessing yeah, because we got graded on, on um, if it was legible or not, and all kinds of stuff when we done our um, handwriting. So I don't know if they just decided it was too much work to teach kids how to do it or why they just, you know. Uh, I'll let you do an embarrassing secret. In fifth grade, they gave out writing certificates. I was the only one in fifth grade not to get one. Oh, my. <laughs> Crushed me forever. <laughs> so uh, any other questions? Yeah, I was just wondering how involved anybody is with the school boards. I uh, keep track of the school board in Perrysburg, and my grandson goes to all the school board meetings in Bowling Green, so he lets me know what they're up to. Well, I, I, was on, what they do, so. I was on the Bowling Green school board for 12 years. Uh, I've been off four years now. And I was on uh, Penna Career Center school board for nine years. Yeah, because so. he's been going since he was in junior high, and he's a senior this year, so he used to go to the board meetings back then. That's supposed to all the council meetings in town, too. Yeah, he probably yeah. saw me towards the uh, junior high days. So. All right, well, I want to thank you all. Hopefully, this was valuable. Uh, yeah. And uh, Lisa or Liz knows how to get a hold of me if yep. you have any other questions or anything I can answer, and I'd be glad to. And I'm also, as she mentioned, the president of the governing board, the Wood County Committee on Aging. So. Uh, if there are any questions not today from this, I'd be glad to answer. Uh, we're hoping to get open again soon. The governor is allowing openings with a whole bunch of guidelines, so we'll be phasing in at some point. Uh, it won't be tomorrow, that's for sure. Well, don't they start opening up or something in, on the 21st of this month? Uh, once we get our guidelines set, and they just sent out the guidelines from the state, uh, I think it was yesterday. Uh, once we're sure that our opening plan is in, in line with those guidelines, we will open. It'll be yeah, slowly I don't think I'll be going back because I, I have a big problem with the mask. I can't breathe with them on, so um, yeah. I probably won't go back until they lift that uh, sanction. Yeah. Let's hope at least by beginning of next year we, we get over that. We'll see. Well, thank you very yeah. much. Thank and, you. Yes. We will, uh, Thank you, Eric, so much you're for welcome. being here. We appreciate it. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. everyone for joining us today. Yeah, thank you all. And I enjoyed your questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll see you all next time. Okay. Bye, <laughs> Bye Lynn.